I mean, we were drifting down these gravel roads, but we never thought it was going to turn into like a sport and make a career out of it. Oh, wait, what? Someone's going to pay us to come and do freestyle motocross? Build wild cars, entertain, and um, yeah, keep chasing dreams. Matt Mike is number one, he's the best. Oh, he should be the Prime Minister. I think he's a legend. There's never been someone like him being able to represent New Zealand. I really love seeing him race. Andrew. To most of us, Mad Mike's an icon, a star of viral Red Bull action videos, motorsport hero, and one of the most successful New Zealand exports ever. But this status wasn't just handed to him on a silver platter, quite the opposite in fact. For me, I grew up with a pretty limited budget. It was for my mum, never met my father, so I've been self-taught from the get-go, from the moto days and um, hustling around the farms on old farm bikes. Me and another close friend of mine, Mark Tapper, we would like race each other to the local dairy which would open about 5.30 and we would get the trade in exchange and be instantly scouting the $1,500 and under section and you could easily pick up an old Mazda 323 or a 626 or Toyota Starlet, you know, for under a hundred bucks. Whether you'd drive out west, you know, we'd try to catch a bus out there. Dude, we were like 13, 14 years old doing this. So I feel like the car scene for me, that was kind of like the thrash stuff, but rotaries have been in my blood from the get go. It's hard to talk about Mad Mike without mentioning the rotary engine. Mike's love affair with Mazdas, and in particular, Mazdas rotaries, started at a very young age and continued to this day. But I remember one of the one of the ladies that rode horses, her boyfriend had an RX4. I would have been nine, probably not even eight or nine years old, and I still remember clearly the satin black RX4 coupe that had a rotary, and he used to tow his girlfriend's horse around on a like single horse float. So this little rotary was like proper struggling with no torque, but I just remember the distinct sound, and I was always like, man, what is that motor? And then it was probably, you know, around the same sort of sort of age of 9, 10 of going to Fong Mata at New Year's and seeing a bunch of teenage boys in this old Toyota Corolla DX with a 12A rotor in it bah, 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 idling down the road and I was like F that is the coolest sounding freaking thing and because I was coming you know I had a little two stroke motocross bikes and stuff so yeah I was just instantly hooked yeah back then it was burnouts and you know I mean we were drifting down these gravel roads but we never thought it was going to turn into like a sport and make a career out of it. Most successful people set their life goals pretty early on in life, and Mike is a good example of that, deciding on his career path by the tender age of 13. I was a kid at 13. I had some pretty solid dreams that I had. I had a very solid vision of where I wanted to be and I wanted to be a sign rider because mum could never afford flash motocross bikes so I would, you know, mum would take me to the sign riding shops, I'd get all their off cuts and I'd make all my own stickers and, and you know, do the graphics myself on my bikes. Um, and then, and I wanted to be a world champion. Ricky Johnson and Jeremy McGrath were my biggest inspiration. So I, I hustled that for all through my teens, uh, early 20s, broke just about every bone in my body. Um, had some really solid results racing um, through my teens. And then the freestyle motocross movement started, uh, crusty demons and dirt. And so I was like, this is my ticket, how I'm gonna get to America. Big day out, um, big music festival. Um, I had Mike Peru, he was the commentator, who was, he knew nothing about the sport, he knew nothing about the athletes. There was only three Kiwis riding. Um, they had brought some Aussie guys over to, you know, had put on a bit more of a show than us, but he kept calling me Mad Mike. And I was like, dude, can you stop calling me Mad Mike? So this is where the, the, the name came from. And then from then, then it just stuck because I had a guy come up to me, said, can you ride next weekend at my 30th birthday? I was like, man, they're not my ramps. You need to speak to Jason. He owns the jump ramp and stuff. So he went and sorted that because then at the end of the day, Jason came up to me um, and said, dude, um, a doodle, wants us to ride, do a FMX demo at his 30th birthday, it's 500 bucks. 
And I was like, bro, count me in, I'll find the 500 bucks. I don't know how, but I'll find the 500 bucks. And he's like, no, he'll pay us 500 bucks. I was like, wait, what? Someone's gonna pay us to come and do freestyle motocross at a birthday? The following weekend, I ended up snapping my femur in half. My bike seized, because I had an older bike. I was paying off like 18 bucks a week, hustle, on the hustle, working at Treescape, um, climbing trees from 5.30 to 5.30. I was working in their workshop from 5.30 to 8.30, fabricating all the trucks, fixing clutches, doing whatever I could to earn a dollar to fuel the passion, you know, of doing burnouts as well at the time of rotaries, chasing this crusty demon dream of getting to America. Becoming an accomplished motocross rider has given Mike his first taste of success, but it was the sport of drifting that would take him all the way to the top. <laughs> Tony and I went down to a local D1NZ event that was here out at Pukekohe. Um, and saw it and was like, both of us looked at each other. I remember it was Fangadan come flying down into the sweeper at, I don't know, 180 odd kilometers an hour, sideways, and yeah, I was like, man, I can do this. Tony's like, yeah, you totally could do this. So we built a drift car, uh, which is Mad Bull now, it was the first drift car we built, and got into drifting, got some real solid results straight out of the bat. First year went to um, California. I managed to qualify for the D1GP World All-Stars. Um, and actually made top 16. I was the only international driver. It was like USA versus Japan and then all these other countries and I was the only other international driver that made it into top 16. Um, and this is my first year drifting as well. Um, from there, had an invite to go to Singapore for the Formula Drift Asia Pacific World Championship. Um, qualified first, finished third overall and came home to an email from Red Bull and that was like, the frickin' dream. And then it was never, I was never thinking about the budget or the financial side that comes with Red Bull and like the actual gives you wins to be able to fly my ideas. It was more so, I just wanted the blue and silver helmet because I knew whoever, cause me a fan myself, you know, you see someone with a, a blue and silver helmet Red Bull branded, you know, like, watch this dude, he's gonna be like the pinnacle. So for me, that was like the dream. And that was now 14 years ago, you know, it's 2008, we got signed up with, with Red Bull. Apart from providing a huge boost to Mike's profile, it was also the relationship with Red Bull that influenced the famous names of Mike's cars. From Mad Bull, Bad Bull, and Rad Bull, to Nimble and Humble. The cars all feature a distinctive bull in their names, each with their own unique story and a unique livery. Honestly, we were just talking about this the other day, Tony and I, she used to sit there next to me as I'd play Need for Speed and because I'm like camo, all my cars have got camo in them somewhere because when I was young and couldn't afford the flash paint jobs, I'd go to Repco, spend 50 bucks on rattle cans and just camo my cars and people were like, fuck, that looks so sick. And um, so you were playing Need for Speed, I'd like, you know, get an RX-7 or something and then I'd just spend hours of getting all these shapes and placing them all over the car and creating like a camo paint job, you know? So I don't know, I've, yeah, now it's like, need for speed in real life. A new build always comes from, I don't know, a vision somehow gets into my head of what's next and it's, yeah, sometimes it's it maybe for a film shoot that we're doing or it may be a championship that we're doing or an event or sometimes it's just the freaking wild or idea or a streetcar. So um, yeah, the vision comes, I don't know, just naturally. I, that, that comes and then a, a, like fortunate for me, I'm able to design and do a lot of it myself with the proposals, you know, designing the wheels, the graphics, the body kits, uh, and very fortunate to work with some of the world's biggest brands. You know, when it comes to the body kits, we've got Rocket Bunny, k Murasan, and so we can sit down on the computer and, uh, yeah, just play with wild designs. When it comes to the wheels, we work with Rotiform out of Compton in LA um, and be able to create the craziest wheels, you know, so it's always, yeah, the, that, that side of it, the design process I find quite simple, um, having the vision and then working with the right people. Um, but then, it, yeah, then it's the marketing side of it, you know, bringing the brands in, the film shoots, the media, because I love to be able to showcase what goes on in a build. You know, a lot of teams are quite secretive about how they've set up their steering knuckles or whatever it may be, suspension, geometry, blah, blah, blah. But for me, I just, I love to, you know, showcase through now we have Facebook and Instagram and all these media channels and I feel like it's that easy for me to literally just 
take a photo of that motor that we've just built and share it to the world. Like, the world can see it within a second that I post it. Bad Bull, for instance, you know, they've go through different generations. We're now at generation eight of uh, the, the Bad Bull RX-8. So we've rebuilt all the motor here at the Mad Lab. We've got new Garrett Turbo. We've got the new Nexus from Haltech. Um, new KW suspension, just kind of using that car has sat in a cafe for a couple of years now. It's crazy to think with me not being able to travel. Um, but yeah, so just always evolving as the partners have got new product and we use it at Summer Bash for the first time. It was freaking incredible. So now that I feel like that car is ready to go as a next pro car. With every build holding a special place in Mike's heart, it would have been cruel to ask him to pick a favorite, but we did anyway. My emotional favorite is definitely Mad Bull. You know I mean? Me and that car have traveled around the world numerous times. We've showcased the sport of drifting to the highest level of competition, uh, demonstrations, Formula One, Goodwood Festival of Speed. Um, and that car's literally got more stamps in its passport than most humans. Mad Bull, that will never leave my side. While the builds are all unique and one of a kind, Mike insists on using off-the-shelf parts that are easily accessible by anyone. I mean, it's with a lot of brands, people are like, oh, this Mike, get to run the secret thing like Haltech. Do, does Mike get the secret custom ECU? No, we run the same ECUs as they sell on the shop for your cars. It's literally, I'm honored to be the first person to be able to get them a lot of the time. So we've just put the Nexus, for instance, we're the first ones to get it. Um, and of course, we we have trust in the partners. It doesn't matter whether it's ECU, the wheels, the suspension. Been working with these companies a long time and as much as they trust me in building these cars and then putting them to the absolute extremes, you know, it's having trust in their product and their development. So, um, yeah, the, the products we run are literally stuff that you can buy straight off the shelf for your car. The next big step was getting involved with Tony Quinn and the creation of the Mad Lab, Mike's own garage and shop front. Yeah, I met Tony Quinn uh, at Goodwood Festival of Speed, actually. So, uh, Scottish lad, spends most of his time now in New Zealand, Australia. Um, and yeah, we built this amazing friendship. As soon as he said he was gonna buy Hampton Downs, I literally found some dirt over the backside that we brought, built our dream home there. Um, yeah, Tony then, he invested in, in the racetrack and turned it into a proper world-class facility, what it is now, and here we are in the Mad Lab. We've always had a nice shop. We were actually on the other side of Toyota, um, the TRS racing um, hub. Here we are over then, we've, we had a nice shop then. Um, however, it was closed to public eye. People would see it on social media, YouTube, you know, Insta, uh, all the documentaries we'd create with Red Bull, um, but it was more closed to public eye. So it's been cool to now open it up so people can actually see everything that's going on. TQ literally giving me a blank canvas to design my own race shop. Drifting took him all around the world. He started competing in New Zealand's B1NZ, then went on to drift at Formula Drift in the USA, and then at the spiritual home of drifting, Japan. Yeah, I love, you know, how humble the Japanese um, people are, the how just how many freaking tracks there are. Like, you know, for us, we can go testing uh, from Kuwato Shop in Kobe, Osaka. There's literally within an hour's drive, we've got about five different tracks we can pick from to go test. Yoichi Mamuro and Daigo Saito and all the guys that when I first discovered drifting, they were the pinnacle to line up against them and to win a championship against them is, yeah, mind blowing. And so the relationship with me and Kawato san of TCP Magic is my first drift event uh, in Japan. Uh, Magic, very well known um, in Japan for rotaries. Um, he was drifting, had a Japanese driver at the time uh, in his RX-7. Um, and yeah, I went up to D1GP with me and my Kiwi team, Chromie at the time. And um, yeah, we met Kuato. We were pitted out of the same uh, garage as him at Okayama. And yeah, we just, created this bond. We have the same passion for rotaries, never stop challenging attitude. Um, and the following year, so we did, yeah, um, we did a little bit out of his workshop, um, but then the following year, uh, he actually approached me uh, with a contract to be his driver in the D1GP Japanese series. So f I was just like going to Japan and competing in D1GP, s sponsored by, a, you know, being a factory driver for a, for a Japanese team. And, and uh, 
yeah, it doesn't get much crazier than that. You can't ever accuse Mike of resting on his laurels. While he's been competing at one event or building a car, he's already busy planning his next project. Always trying to think of what's next. I don't sleep much because I'm always thinking like as soon as I fall asleep that everyone else is starting to catch up. The only time I got to relax, I say, is when I'm driving on the motorway at 100 kilometers an hour or if I'm mowing my lawns on the lawnmower. I love showcasing the sport of drifting that people see or just perceive as just doing some donuts and some burnouts um, and showcasing that we're literally drifting faster than a lot of the race cars around the same circuits, yet we're sideways waving to the kids on the fence. From drifting in front of live audience at Goodwood, World Time Attacked and Drift Shifters to starring in Red Bull's action videos, Mike successfully managed to bring the sport of drifting to the masses. There's, a, there's such a variety from the demonstration stuff, the competition stuff, the film shoot stuff where we're doing like, you know, Crown Range was the first clip to get a million views overnight from Red Bull. Like I say, different mindsets, the fear element, like doing Crown Range and these film shoots and stuff around the world, like I think the film shoot side of things, you're working with such a big team. There's me in the car that are the heroes of the clip, yet there's frickin' a production team of 50 to 100 people with flying helicopters and you know, you've got all the still guys. It's, it's just, for me, it's like making the whole team like work and then seeing the production and then executing it to the fans, I feel like is probably the funnest part of my, of the job, yeah. Mike now runs a series of his own drifting events at Hamden Downs. And this year, he's added drag racing to the calendar. That's right, drag racing. You guys all know about Mad Mike, right? So Mad Mike is the drifter. Okay, well, I can tell you a little bit more about Mad Mike as the drag racer. So he used to turn up here in his camo van and camo wagons and do skids. But before he would do skids on the racetrack, he would do skids in the pits. Mikey is a drag racer at heart. He knows it, you know, he can, he can, and he can vouch for me too because he got in trouble in the pits there back in the day. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. I think I used to be your worst enemy when it, as first started Ford Road and that's all I could afford was to do burnout, so. I do them wherever I possibly could find asphalt, but now it's about sticking to the rules, mate. Shit. So, but yeah. Not one to just sit idly and watch the action. Mike took to the strip in his drift cars, much to the delight of the crowds. Staying relatable in a quickly changing world of motorsport is not an easy task, but Mike's fan base just got another generation of new followers, thanks largely to Mike's son, Lincoln, who decided to follow in his father's footsteps. Say, Lincoln, we're done. Use it all. Man, little Link, far out, he's just really raced through life. I feel like at the start was, with me, it was like, personally racing him through life, like come on, get him to crawl, stand up, frickin' ride a bike, drive a buggy. And then he was six years old and literally could beat me at anything. He could reach the pedals, simulators, go-karts, whatever. Um, now, you know, it, it was always a dream of mine for him to be, like, get into the drifting. It's the most common question he's always been asked. Is he gonna be a drifter like dad, blah, blah, blah. You know, at all these events, he's a pretty well-traveled kid. Um, but he's done off-road racing since you know, the age of six, uh, he got second in the New Zealand Nationals, bet, you know, a lot of the teenage boys. Um, and so I, f I feel like, you know, you listen to Link talk about his off-road racing where he explains it as he gets to drift and do jumps and roost through puddles and, you know, bang doors with 20, 30 trucks and they roll over and they do 10 laps, not three corners. And, you know, so it's kind of like that excitement level, but he's got to an age now where like I see he can see how I build my cars and express my style and personality. So yeah, we got a car that's, you know, people are like, man, what a lucky kid for his 12th birthday, he got a MX-5. Well, an MX-5 back then was cheaper than a PlayStation. And then we spent a four week lockdown literally pulling this thing apart, you know, building 12A, little rotary for it, piecing it together. Then we have a lot of my support from my race partners, Jump On Board Link's program, and we were able to create No Kidding. And then Link just done his first pro drift event, his youngest competitor here in New Zealand. Um, 
to compete in a pro competition and out-qualified man was in the top 10 at Summer Bash last weekend. So. While it may look wild from a distance, Lincoln's car is actually a relatively budget-friendly build, inspiring a new generation of enthusiasts to pick up the tools and start building their own projects. Yeah, you know, it's funny, a lot of people look at it and like, oh man, Link, you live the dream, man, living in a factory of all these race cars. But then it's like the simple things in life that he didn't have been able to just jump the fence and go play with any neighbors or, I don't know, I just feel like the best thing for youngsters is for them to find their own passion and chase it themselves. I believe I got to where I am because I'd never met my father. And for me, I had the freedom from mum. Like, I, like I never had all the flashest, fastest motorbikes, but it was my passion and my determination to chase that vision. Juggling international travel, sponsorship commitments, building cars and running events while raising two kids with healthy interests and hobbies can get stressful. Incredibly, amongst all that controlled mayhem, Mike still has time to talk to his fans, sign autographs and promote the sport he loves so much. And I, like, I think coming from freestyle motocross, again, I never looked at the judging criteria at freestyle motocross. So I was just literally go out there and entertain and do what would like scare me and entertain the crowd. I love fear. People, um, I don't know, for me, it's finding that balance of fear and adrenaline. Because drifting is the most accessible sport to get at motorsport, I believe anyway, to get, um, uh, make a career out of it or just go out there and have some fun. You can literally have a hundred, uh, Link proved it with a little MX-5, you know, that was cheaper than a PlayStation. Put a little 12A into it that's less than 200 horsepower and he's out there ripping, you know, in the rain, he could link the whole track up, no worries. I'm still driving every single day I'm in a car, whether it's, you know, a little go-kart or it's always pushing the limit. Um, like I said, I love the fear, I love the adrenaline um, and I feel very honored, massive proper dream come true. It's not hard to see why this young kid from New Zealand who made it big on the global stage is an inspiration to a whole generation. If you ever wondered if chasing your dreams can actually pay off, here's a guy who made it happen. Cricket, rugby or soccer, you need to play whatever. If you want to be a successful sportsman, that's what you need to play. I'm like, man, I still can't even kick a ball straight, but I prove that, yeah, you can you know, make a career in motorsport. Like the coolest dude in New Zealand, honestly. Yeah. Everything he does is just awesome. He's an icon for New Zealand, he's, yeah. Build wild cars, entertain, and um, yeah, keep chasing dreams.